Material Revision Control System, sand slides for the moment, but soon with slides. And um, by Brian's own admission, he builds large distributed stuff. Well, not large by your standards. Not large by our standards, though. And I just wanted to let you know that this talk is going to go up on Google Video, so if you have any questions that you think might contain uh, information that's particularly googly, let's hold those until the end after the camera's off. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Okay, thank you, Leslie. Let me see what a good distance is here. All right. So. About um, 12 months ago, I was uh, casting about for a revision control system that I could use to write the next late, great desktop email system that nobody was going to use. And uh, unfortunately, during my uh, passing around the place, I found that there was nothing entirely suitable to my needs. So I found a piece of software that was almost suitable, which had just gotten started on by a guy that I happened to know. And this was a tool called Mercurial. And the origins of Mercurial are, are steeped in um, the great Bitkeeper debacle of 2005, when Larry McVoy took his marbles and left the playground. So at that time, Linus Torvalds was uh, left without a revision control system and started writing his own. At the same time, Matt McCall started working on a revision control system. And they converged on fairly similar de designs, although in substantially different ways. And so now the world has two 14-month-old revision control systems instead of one to join a field of a huge pile of free revision control systems already. So why am I actually interested in this particular one? Why am I in here to talk to you about this? Well, there's a couple of different reasons that it's uh, interesting to me here. And um, one is that Mercurial kind of matches a few aspects of the, uh, the Google state religion, as I understand it, from the outside. And those are that it's written in Python. It is distributed, and it does things very fast. So these are kind of nice properties to have. Now, it's not completely Python. It's only 95% Python. There's a couple of core routines that are written in C. But what we've gotten in the, uh, in the 12 months or so since people have started actually using this stuff is a fair number of um, third-party people, both open source and commercial projects, have actually started using it, which is really kind of an interesting vote of confidence, right? Normally, revision control holds the crown jewels of whatever it is that you're doing. So it had, by God, better work properly, or else you're going to have serious problems. But in that time, we've had a couple of interesting people start to use Mercurial. We have the Zen source people. Those are doing um, the open source Linux hypervisor. Um, we have the One Laptop Per Child project, the Open Solaris project, the Moin Moin Wiki, and a pile of other people who are uh, playing around with it to various different extents, some of them large, some of them small. But it's pretty fun to be working on something that's young and yet has interesting and active users already. So from a de developer's point of view, right, you're, you're, you're sitting down in front of your computer and you're about to start your magnum opus. You're going to work on the next great novel or the next great huge source base or whatever it's going to be. You're looking for criteria to choose one of these revision control systems. There's got to be at least 50 of them extant at the moment. Ah, thanks, Chuck. This actually does the job. <laughs> Um, so what are, what are some criteria? Well, I can tell you what I used, at least, for my own personal purposes, which was I wanted something that was straightforward to understand, so I was going to be able to spend my time thinking about my problem instead of my revision control problem. I wanted something that was pretty quick, so that my tea would still be warm when I was finished a particular revision control operation. And I wanted something that would help me to work efficiently with other people, that being kind of a motivating factor. Oh, you want to get this onto a Windows box? I think we're going to be slideless. It'll work. It'll work? Yeah. You've got open office, open office you say? Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it'll work. OK. So the Mercurial revision control system has a conceptual model that's very simple. Um, I've had it described to me as you can carry it around in your head, and I like to think of it that way myself. There, there are basically three different things that you need to pay attention to if you're thinking about revision control in Mercurial and in many other distributed revision control systems. The first is that you have a repository, which is where your stuff lives. The second is you have a working directory, which is where the stuff you're working on lives. And the last one is a change set, which is a snapshot of what's going on. So in mercurial terms, a repository is not a heavyweight thing. It does not have a database behind it. It's just a pile of files. So these are things that are easy to create. They're easy to administer. You put, put one together and blow one away in a matter of moments. And that's how people prefer to work. Um, they are, as I mentioned, lightweight, and they are pretty much everywhere. Everywhere that you happen to be doing some work in a working directory, there's a repository that happens to be wedded to it. 
So inside a repository, there are only really three different things. There's a change log which says, I've done this work. There's a manifest that says, I did the work on these versions of these files, and then there's the file metadata. That's all you need to know to understand the underpinnings of the revision control software. It's very, very straightforward. Now you contrast that model with um, the internals of a more traditional large-scale revision control system like ClearCase or Perforce or something like that. And if the internals are visible to you at all, they're typically not, they're going to be a big pile of different things. The mercurial uh, source code is, I think it might have grown to almost 12,000 lines now, but it's a fully functional system and it's 12,000 lines of Python. So you can keep all of it in your head as a developer. You can keep all that you need to know in your head as a user. It's got a couple of very good properties in that respect. Now a change set, as I mentioned, is a snapshot of your project as it stands at a particular point in time. It corresponds to a revision in Perforce or Subversion or any of these other tools. And uh, the terminology that we use for creating a change set is committing it. Now unfortunately, I have some pretty graphics here that you're not able to see at the moment about how you go about creating these things. And what starts being interesting then is how you go about merging and branching with people. So I'll have to uh, hand wave since I have no graphics to offer here. Um, when two people work, they will create clones of each other's repositories. Yes? A whiteboard would actually help, yeah. When I start working, I create a repository, and it's just a little directory called .hg somewhere. And outside that repository is the actual directory. Let's say I'm working on a project called foo. So I have foo slash .hg. That's where all my metadata lives. I don't need to actually care about anything that's in there. The working directory where I have my files, like copying and you know, read me in foo.c lives around this .hg directory. That's where I do all my actual work. So somebody else will make a clone of this and they'll have an identical copy of the working directory and they'll have an identical copy of the .hg directory. And they start working there and they start creating a revision. And let's say they create revision one and I create something and I call it revision one too because I don't know about their changes because this is a distributed system, right? So we go on and we create revision two, say, as well. Um, now the next thing that we need to do here is we need to be able to communicate with each other to say, we're working on the same project and now we have diverging views of the world, how do we cause them to reconverge? Well, what I do is I pull my changes from one repository into the other and that literally means I just take the directed acyclic graph that is all of my revisions and I blob them in here and after I do a pull, I do a merge. And what the merge does is it just creates a structure in the working directory such that I have my revision one, my, your revision one, my revision two, your revision two. And then in the working directory, the working directory has a notion of there being parents. So you can think of the working directory as a floating revision. It's the last stuff that I had, the merger of these two guys, and the stuff that I'm about to commit that is the result of the merge. So the working directory gets all these things, I do my commit, and I'm done. And that's all there is to it. So a branch in Mercurial is just a revision that has uh, two different parents. Now, I haven't actually drawn a branch here. OK. Look, here's a branch. This is a, this is a revision that has two children. And this being a merge is a revision that has two parents. And that's all a merge is. So there's no. There's no special sauce there. If you, if you think of a branch in Subversion as being something very simple, it's just a copy. The analog in Mercurial is also, it's very simple, it's just two revisions that happen to have um, the same parent. And of course, you can have an arbitrary number of branches. We only allow merges one at a time because nobody's really found a good way to explain multi-way merge to people and their heads explode. Heads exploding, not so good. So, when people work in parallel, and they make these changes, and they commit them, and then they merge after they change, that's kind of a nice property to have. Because if you think back to what you used to have to do in the days of CVS, history was linear. People would do a change, they'd do a change, they'd do a change. And if you won the commit race before I managed to make a commit, I had to merge with your changes before I could do a commit. And that meant that there was no permanent record of my changes. Now, with this model, you don't end up having that kind of risk. 
With CVS, it was very straightforward to shoot yourself in the foot by screwing up a merge. It happened all the time. You would see changes that got checked in with conflict markers, badness ensued. Subversion sort of avoids this, but the default policy is to work the same way that CVS does. In Subversion, you have to explicitly choose to work on a separate branch. It's the same thing with Perforce. Um, the distributed tools necessarily don't work that way, and it's a slightly safer way to do things, um, because it, one default policy is less safe than the other. In practice, I don't know that it makes a huge difference. You don't hear people saying that I you know, threw away three weeks of work in Subversion or in Perforce or in any of these other tools very frequently. So with many of these things, what you get is a, is a matter of degree in terms of uh, loss or gain of functionality. How are we? OK, a couple of things that are, that are interesting to know about Mercurial for getting going and keeping going quickly. Um, if you're working in a, in a small, lightweight environment, it's useful to have, for example, a built-in web server, which we have. So this is a web server that you can both interact with as a person and view revisions in your tree and annotate things and download tarballs. But it's also what Mercurial uses to, uh, to fetch data and to, uh, very soon now, push data uh, over the network as well. It also works over SSH if you happen to uh, prefer security. In addition, uh, Mercurial has a, essentially a, a single way to stream bytes onto the disk and to stream them off the disk. We call that abstraction a bundle. So you can put bundles onto USB drives or you can send them around an email and you get a complete set of change history that you can transfer without having to be online at the time. This is kind of a useful property to have for people doing distributed development. So sharing is also a, uh, what would you call it, a, a symmetric operation. In other words, when I make a clone of a repository and I start making changes and I push my changes back to the parent repository, I don't know where this buzzing is coming from, um, I end up with both repositories being identical afterwards. OK, the buzz has stopped. I can step back and look at my slides again. Ah. So the final thing, and the thing that is sort of the, the special sauce in, in Mercurial, is that Mercurial is, albeit written in Python, an extremely fast system. Um, we've benchmarked it under various different scenarios. And there are only a few other revision control systems that compare in terms of performance. Now, performance is interesting in its own right because it means that you don't get distracted while you're waiting for the tool to do things. But it also enables you to do certain kinds of operations that are not necessarily otherwise possible. So in order to, uh, to, to give a little bit of an apples to apples comparison, the other day I um, <coughs> went to the, uh, the Subversion self-hosting repository where they've had uh, Subversion developed for the past four or five years. And I just did a Subversion checkout of the uh, Subversion source tree. And the, the head of the source tree as a working directory is about 72 megabytes in size. So out of curiosity, I sucked all of the Subversion history into Mercurial and um, created a local Mercurial repository that's an identical copy of what's on the Subversion website. And it turns out that the Mercurial repository plus working directory is about the same size as the Subversion working copy. So I have 15,000 revisions and a working directory in 76 megabytes versus just a working copy in 72 megabytes, which I thought was kind of interesting. It means that you don't have to pay much in order to get a complete history of everything onto your machine where you're no longer talking to the network. One of the things that you've probably noticed if you've been dealing with the Perforce servers here is that things take an awfully long time once uh, your servers are busy. Central servers don't scale terribly well. You prefer not to talk to them if you don't have to. In a distributed tool, you tend to not talk to them very often at all, maybe a couple of times a week. And so also, out of curiosity, I ran a couple of uh, very simple performance tests. Now, the Subversion repository is very small. It's only about 1,200 files, and it's only about the, the, the actual working copy when you ignore all the .svn directories and so on. It's only 25 megabytes in size. And pound for pound, Mercurial and Subversion worked out about the same. There were a few instances where one was faster and a few instances where the other one was faster. But what's interesting about one being faster or the other being faster on a small test case is Primarily that you can write something in Python and have it be as fast as something that's written in pure C if you're clever about how you do it. And I assert without immediate proof that, in fact, Mercurial will scale to large projects better than 
many revision control systems that are written in C because of the underlying abstractions that we use and the implementation techniques, might I add. So there are a couple of different things that we, that we do in order to make the implementation go fast. The primary one is that we've desperately tried at every step to avoid seeks. Disk seeks are not your friend. Disk seeks are things that cause you to just sit around and wait for good things to happen. Good things that happen are streaming I.O. linearly off your disk. That's what we really like. So in order to stream I.O. linearly off your disk, there are a couple of things that you would like to be able to do. The first is you don't want to write more than you have to, and the second is that you don't want to read more than you have to. So what, what are the necessary properties for a revision control system to not write more than you have to? Well, it's been dogma in revision control for a while um, that what you really want to do is you want to store the most recent revision of your file as the very first thing on the disk, and then everything wants to be reverse deltas based on that. Because that means that you get the nice property of something that you accessed recently, you can just read with a single read. Now, Mercurial sort of turns that a little bit on its head. We do forward deltas from the very first revision, but that sounds like it's a terrible imp implementation plan. It's actually, what would you say? It's, uh, it's rather better than that, because what we do is we have O of 1 retrieval properties. So instead of having a very first revision and 10 million little tiny deltas on top of that that you have to reconstruct the final revision out of, what we do is we have two different techniques. One is that every so often when the accumulated quantity of stuff that you've deltaed gets to be too big, we store a full text. So you pay something of an extra space cost on disk, but you end up with O of 1 retrieval properties. The other thing that we do is, rather than applying each delta as we go, we uh, compose our deltas and then we just apply one single union delta at the end. And that gets rid of some of the nasty properties that you have when you're composing deltas and munging strings in Python. So these are two things that make it quite fast and quite efficient to get nice linear accesses. Another thing that you can do that gives you linear accesses at something of a cost in space is you might think that if you're doing a delta, you want to do a delta against your parent. Um, so if I'm at revision 3 and I have a child that is a revision 7 that is really based on revision 3, I want to do a delta against revision 3. Not necessarily, because if you're doing a delta against revision 3 and you're a revision 7, there might be a seek involved. So what if at revision 7 you do a delta against revision 6 and you don't actually care whether revision 6 was related to you at all? Well, in that case, you pay something of a greater space uh, penalty, but you end up with a linear space, or, or uh, pardon me, a linear disk access and a guaranteed lower probability of seeks. So again, it's another case of make the seeks go away, do linear stuff instead, even if it costs me slightly more space, even if it looks like it ought to be a less good choice. Many times these are not the case when you uh, subject them to a little bit of inspection. Right, back to my hints as to where I am. Um, the file formats that we use are very straightforward. They're binary files, but they're easy to parse in Python. And the reason that they're easy to parse in Python is that we use the struct unpack and pack methods a lot, and we use string splitting and unsplitting a lot. And the reason that these are good things to use is that they don't go through the Python interpreter at all. They go straight from the Python interpreter into C. Fast things occur, you get dropped back into Python land. We also try and avoid um, uh, things like conditionals in our inner loops, because those tend to cost in performance as well. So if you look at the mercurial inner loops, they tend to be quite tight. They're still written in Python, but um, they do very, very simple things. And then they deal in terms of tuples or arrays or whatever happens to come out the other side. We're out of luck. I, I, I can open the file, but it doesn't, it doesn't show me any content. It's you have, you, you have Open file. Office 1, and I have Open Office 2. Okay. I'm sorry. That's OK. OK. Continues to be a mime show for the rest of the presentation, sorry, I'm okay. afraid. The, the final thing that's kind of interesting about um, implementation techniques is that I mentioned avoiding reads. Well, why read at all if you can stat? What if you were to store, instead of um, just spewing your files out onto disk, you also stored the information as to what the, the stat of each file was when you uh, wrote the, the file. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean you store the modification time, the size, and the access time of each file and the owner. And then when you're looking through a tree to see what was the last thing that happened to my tree, 
instead of reading the file, you do a start of the file, you look at the last time you started the file, you see if they're different in any way, and then you do a read to see if you really need to say, yes, this file has been modified or no. So what this means is, in a 40,000 file tree, Mercurial does stat 40,000 times, but it doesn't read and reconstruct each file 40,000, or it doesn't read and reconstruct 40,000 files. Again, this is a, a significant space win compared to uh, doing things by hand. So, I've mentioned that things are fast. Yes? So it sounds like you are designing for local disk. Yes. Not, not an NFS home directory. Um, things are not as fast over NFS, this is true. So the, the, an obvious place that you can make things fast over NFS is by using an implementation technique like Perforce, where you have to tell a server everything that you're doing, right? That's a potentially less friendly thing to do. I, I, I was able to live with P4 edit back when I had to use Perforce, but having to not do it and being able to do things on a local disk happens to suit me pretty well. So let me turn this around so I can see it. So speed is, uh, it's, it's an end in itself, all other things being equal. It's nice to have something fast instead of something slow. But what speed also lets you do is it lets you do things that are not straightforward using other tools. So Mercurial was originally developed by kernel hackers. And the kernel is a reasonably large tree. It's not super large. It's like 20,000 files or so. But one of the things that kernel developers tend to have to do a lot is deal with patches because there are certain gatekeepers for, for pieces of subsystems, and you may be developing something that isn't ready to go off to somebody else yet, so you maintain a pile of patches that your software has to work with. And working with patches is traditionally kind of a painful thing, um, because revision control tools don't normally have a concept of patches. But what if you did have a concept of patches? Well, Mercurial has an extension called Mercurial Queues. Um, if you've been working with open source tools that, that you have to patch in order to get working, you may have come across a tool called Quilt. And Quilt basically lets you maintain a, pa a stack of patches on top of a source tree. It doesn't care what the source tree is. It has no notion of there being an underlying revision control system of any kind. So Quilt has the nice property that it will sit on top of anything. It doesn't matter whether it's Perforce, CVS, or an exploded tarball. And what Quilt lets you do is it lets you push a patch onto your stack, edit some files, refresh the patch, push another patch on top of your stack, refresh the files, etc., etc., etc. You can pop and push and work on the top of stack arbitrarily. Mercurial Queues works the same way, but it's integrated into Mercurial. So what this means is, after you've pushed a pile of patches onto your stack, you can now use the regular log commands or the annotate command to find out which revision that has turned into a change set in the tree um, made a particular change. When you pop your patches, the change sets go away. And once you're done, you can push the change sets off to somebody else as regular mercurial revisions, and they see them as regular mercurial revisions. And then they start distributing your changes, and goodness occurs. But the nice thing about this is the, is the integrated nature of it. So for example, if you're doing a bug search, one of the things that people have started using the past year or two with, um, with tools like Git and Mercurial is um, dichotomic search of your revision graph. Now what that means is you're essentially doing a bisectional search. I know I have a revision that was bad, I know I have a revision that was good, and I want to narrow my way down to the revision that was the thing that caused the state to flip as quickly as I can. So if you can do this using your revision control tools, um, rather than having to worry about the join, the boundary between where my patches start and where my revisions end, if everything is just seamless and you don't have to worry, that's kind of a benefit. As an example of how well Mercurial Queues works, um, Andrew Morton maintains a pile of patches against the Linux kernel that is, I think it's about 1,500 patches at the moment um, that are just a single quilt patch series. I can apply those on top of a Linux kernel repository in, I think, something on the order of three minutes. So I can create seven change sets per second for three minutes to get all of these patches into my tree. And then, as far as Mercurial is concerned, it's just a regular old tree that I'm working in that has 1,500 new revisions in there that I can deal with, that I can serve up, that I can communicate with other people, but that I can also modify after the fact by popping, editing, and re-pushing. And then I can continue to share those changes with a Quilt user because Mercurial Queues is Quilt compatible. This is a fairly tremendous win, not just for dealing with upstream software projects, but also for prototyping and developing your own code. 
quite often if I'm working on a feature, what I'll do is I won't actually start committing changes because I'm kind of an idiot. I don't tend to know where I'm going a lot of the time. I'll, I'll start off and I'll go down a blind alley and then I'll go down another two blind alleys along the way and after a couple of days I'll have converged on something that looks like a solution. But along the way what I'll have done was I'll have thought in terms of here is the underpinnings of my work, one patch. Here is another thing that I need to have in place, another patch. And at each point when I'm refactoring my code or I'm moving something between one layer and another layer, I just move hunks from one patch into another patch and I push and pop my context at various different times to be working on a different patch at each point. So this is, um, it's, it's, it's not just for working with other people, it's for, it's for collaborating with yourself as your clue evolves over time. Very good property to have. So finally, there are a couple of things that are, that are interesting to me about distributed revision control that are not specific to Mercurial but that might be of interest to people who do things with uh, free software and open source tools in general. I have this, this idea that choosing a particular revision control tool is actually making a statement about how you want your project to evolve, right? So if you work in a large company and everybody has essentially a, living pl a level playing field, everybody is more or less likely to have commit access to much the same stuff. And everybody can pull the same changes, everybody can push the same changes or you know, integrate changes or whatever the, the particular tools language lets you do. But as in the open source world, that's really not the case, right? If you're using a tool like CVS or you're using a tool like Subversion, there's a world of haves and there's a world of have-nots. There are the people who have commit access to the one central repository that everybody has to use. And then there are the people who can maybe read from that repository. They can check out a working copy, but they can't commit and they may not be able to earn the right to commit until they've proven themselves over the course of a number of uh, patches that they've submitted and had to maintain. Now, if you've been in the position of having to maintain a patch against an upstream source tree, it's kind of a painful thing to have to do. Tools like Quilt will make it more straightforward, but really what you would like to be able to do is work with other people speaking the same language using the same tools. With a distributed tool, you can do that. With a centralized tool, unless they're willing to create a little sandbox that people can go do wild in, which Wiki's history and the history of other collaborative commons on the net have proven is not necessarily a very scalable thing, um, they can't do. So you, you could think of it as, as, as being analogous to the ascent of man, right? In the days of RCS and SCCS, everybody crawled on all fours and they had to be on the same machine in order to get any work done. And then suddenly everybody's tails fell off and they started going around on hunchbacks and they were able to talk to the central repository over the network, but they had to be on the network in order to get any work done, right? If I unplug your workstation from the Perforce server, there's nothing you can do. If I unplug your workstation from a subversion server, you can run diff and nothing else. Um, with the distributed tool, that's no longer the case. I can work on the train, I can work on a mountaintop. So long as I have history and I can access my hard disk, I'm set. So I can work anywhere, I can contribute with, to any project, I can work with anybody with a distributed tool. The tools don't make the boundary, it's the, the, the social norms of your project that you explicitly choose that make the boundary. You choose the model yourself with a, with a distributed tool. You don't have it imposed on you by the technology. So I would encourage you to uh, give this stuff a try. Um, Mercurial, as I said, it lets you work as a centralized system if that's what you prefer. If you want to work in a distributed fashion, you can. And one of the reasons that people have cited to me a few times for using centralized tools is that they're afraid of forks. So Guido works here, for example, and he does not like Stackless Python at all. Stackless Python is this project that started about eight years ago that went off in a direction that was fundamentally different to the way that he wanted to bring Python itself. And, um, for example, the GCC people have had the same problem, right? EGCS forked off from GCC many years ago, and they eventually managed to reconcile their differences and start working together. But what's interesting about using a tool that has good support for merging and good support for branching is that everybody forks all the time, right? Forking is, is just what you do, and merging is what you do when you're done forking. So once somebody has decided that they want to play nice again and they want to cooperate with you, you just merge. 
Whereas in a central tool, what somebody has had to do is they've had to suck all the history out of your central repository. They've had to shove it all back into another central repository. If you want to reconcile your differences, you've got a serious problem on your hands all of a sudden because there's no way to make the two communicate. That's just not the case with a distributed tool. So what would you say? It, make, it makes it easier to reconcile your differences. A final couple of comments that I have before we finish off. Um, there's a number of people who work on subversion here at Google, and I've been very um, conscious along the way as I've been, uh, what would you say, trying to shepherd people into sending patches into Mercurial and so on, of the great job that these subversion people have done in terms of building a good community around their tool. If you're working on open source software, the only thing that you have going for you is A, technical merit, and B, credibility. And Carl Fogel and Jim Blandy and um, Brian Fitzpatrick and Ben Collins Sussman and Garrett Rooney and all those other people who've worked on Subversion over year, the years, they've done a very good job of making themselves accessible and making the Subversion community be a place that is a good place to contribute to, right? You send a patch in, somebody's going to review it and say, yeah, could you tweak this? Yeah, could you tweak that? It's a nice property to have. And I've been very explicit in trying to emulate their example as we've, uh, as we've been building Mercurial. Um, because it's always nice to try and learn from somebody else's good examples rather than to try and blaze a trail of your own. And that's, I think, stood us in good stead. Um, I actually ran a survey of our users a couple of months ago just to get a sense of where people thought we were. You know, it's very easy when you're a developer to stay down in the trenches and, and look at the next line of code that you need to write or look at the next patch that you need to, to issue or the next bug that you need to fix. But it's nice to get a sense of what your users think about you. And people have been pretty complimentary about us. People are also quite happy with the software in terms of the fact that it's easy to install, easy to use, not too different from tools like CVS and Subversion. Um, and it's, it's been very rewarding to actually be able to talk to people and say, look, here's this nice shiny toy that we have that you can, that you can use for something, be it small or be it large, it'll scale and, and work for you across all of these different sizes of thing. That kind of comes to the end of my prepared comments. Thanks very much for bearing with me as I've had to uh, essentially hand wave my way through. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions people have. person does a small amount of work. And the answer is that there's not very much cost to it. So bringing in changes from the outside is essentially a linear operation in the number of changes that you've made. Um, so cloning a repository, all 20,000 revisions, or just pulling in two changes, um, they have approximately linear costs. So one costs about 10,000 times as much as the other. So if you've done 10,000 things and I've done two, and I pull in your 10,000 things, it takes me about you know, 10,000 units of time to process those changes. The actual merge afterwards is primarily a matter of updating the working directory. Most of your changes are not going to conflict with most of my changes. And then what happens with the few conflicts that there are is really, it's almost not a matter for Mercurial itself. We have a couple of different merge strategies that people can use when there are conflicts. But can the conflict, can you tell you know, your common ancestor Yes. Yes. You, can you tell the original common ancestor? Yes, you can. Sorry if I'm repeating your questions, but I'm just trying to make sure that the uh, folks back home can hear what you're saying. Yes. You talked about using patch sets uh, as sort of a local mechanism for yourself. Why wouldn't you just clone the repository and actually use the real material, uh, like real so, revision to commit and then re-merge it with this? So the, uh, the, the question was about using uh, a set of patches for doing development of your own stuff rather than um, using regular mercurial tools in order to capture all of the history. And um, what would you say? That's, it's, it's partly a style thing, and it's, um, it's partly a, 
a wanting to not clutter the history thing. So you may have heard me allude to the fact that I will go down blind alleys. Well, I don't necessarily want my idiocy caught in the permanent record if I can necessarily avoid it, right? Um, so it's, it's nice, for example, particularly if you're dealing with um, an environment like um, the Linux kernel, where there is quite a high standard for your changes to meet in order for them to get in. You really want things to be packaged cleanly. That's one environment where it makes sense to think in terms of patches, because you want to submit the pristine final thing, not the 45 different idiot things that you did along the way. Um, for my own purposes as well, it, it, it helps me to think in terms of patches, because then I'm both, um, I'm, 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 what would you say, I'm putting layers on my thought, I'm, I'm linearizing my thought in, in space and in time, right? In, in, so each patch captures a layer that I'm worrying about. I can actually revision control the patches themselves. So I do capture the history of the changes, but just not in the actual repository that they're eventually going to end up in. Um, but I also have the ability to go back and erase history and make myself look better, which is very nice. Yeah? How well does it handle read backwards that involve renames and new code, lots of code? The question is, how well Mercurial handles refactoring that handles renames and uh, moving code around? So there are, there are three answers to that. One is that it doesn't. Um, the second is that it does it really well. And the third is that it will be really all there soon. Um, and th these are all true at the same time. Um, so right now, Mercurial has a shell script that handles merging. So it knows how to figure out the, the, the bases for doing a three-way merge, for example. And it will hand those off to the shell script. Now, we have a couple of different shell scripts in place. One is a shell script that will run a three-way merge tool. But three-way merge is not very satisfying when you're doing distributed development, because you frequently have cases where there are crisscross merges, right? I pull your changes at the same time that you've pulled my changes, and we both commit the results of our mergers. We end up at a state where we have to merge again, and that can iterate a few times. In those kinds of cases, you would really like to have some sort of more history-sensitive merge that will cause, cause us to converge more quickly. There is a branch of Mercurial that has that facility available. In terms of handling renaming, though, right now we track rename information, and Matt McCall, who is the guy who uh, wrote uh, much of the Mercurial code, or originally started the project, um, is working on actually having your changes follow across renames. Um, and by the way, the, the, the question that is sort of implicit there is, if I make an edit to a file, and you've renamed the file to a different name, you really want the changes to show up under the different name after we've resolved our differences. So that's not there yet, but the actual machinery underlying it, it that's necessary is there, and the feature will be present soon. Uh, sorry, I'll give somebody else a chance first. What yeah? What platforms are supported? What platforms are supported? Uh, pretty much anything that Python runs on um, that has a file system behind it that looks vaguely unix -y. So Windows, you name the brand of Unix and Macs and so on. Um, yeah. How do your shell scripts work on Windows? The shell scripts work on Windows by being run as .bat files. Of course, they're not actual shell scripts there. They're .bat files, but nevertheless, Separate they work. Copies. Yes. Uh, yes. So do you support the partial cloning, checkout, bring over, whatever, partially bringing? Do we support partially bringing stuff over? Somebody is working on that at the moment. And um, there, there are two different kinds of partially, partially bringing stuff over, right? One is you want maybe only the last few thousand revisions of your project history because you don't want to be carrying around the umpty umpty gigabytes of earlier stuff that was done 10 years ago. And the other thing is that perhaps you're only interested in working in a certain portion of the tree, so you don't want to have to check out the other 10 gigabytes of stuff that you don't care about. And by the way, when I say gigabytes, some people are actually using Mercurial to work on multi-gigabyte source trees. For example, the uh, FreeBSD, FreeBSD ports tree has a port that sits in Mercurial instead of in Perforce, and it contains, I think, something on the order of 150,000 files and 150,000 change sets. So that's you know a reasonably large amount of stuff, and you really want to be able to focus on a certain aspect of it rather than do all of it. It's a it's in progress. Yes. Uh, generalizations of the rename scenario is yeah. that we have a blob file that's saying we start splitting it up into newer files. Yeah. Will those scripts handle that as well? Yes. Um, so the question is, if you split a file up into multiple files, will Mercurial handle that? And I can't speak for Matt because uh, it turns out that I'm not actually him. But I believe that his plan of record is to, when a 
rename or copy has been detected, do a merge into each of the children, um, the descendants of the original file. So if you copy one file into three different files, and then you whack off the first third, middle third, and the final third in those three different files, somebody else makes an edit in the original file, the logically appropriate thing ought to happen. Now, I'm not actually doing the implementation, so I can say, yes, it will be a better world and everybody will be happy. I don't know how hard it's going to be. But yes? On a small scale, can you somehow customize the story of the for a small number of clients that you can secure it in a central repository of, you know, in a centralized fashion so that they can, when they, when they do updates, they are doing, say, append-only updates, say, something like, say, bug database, then people are writing to it and, and keep on reading what other people have written, but they don't need yes. to worry about merge or anything like that. Sure. So the question is, can you, um, can you extend Mercurial so that it essentially behaves like CVS, so that uh, when you do an update, it, it, it does the logical equivalent of a pull, and so that you don't have to worry about merging, so that you have a, a, a straightforward, simple way for people to, uh, to, to get their feet wet? And the answer is, yes, Mercurial is extensible in those terms. No, nobody has explicitly done the work to do that. Um, I do know that there's at least one other distributed revision control system that, that does exactly what you describe because they want to give people who've used CVS essentially training wheels, right? Um, so it, it is possible to do that and it would be quite straightforward. You know, contributions of code to do things like that are always welcome. <laughs> yes? Well, can I push a patch back into history? Can I push a patch back into history? Let's say um, I released version 2.1. And now I'm working on version 2.10, and then I found a bug that's already existing in 2.1. Yeah. I push the fix of the bug back to from uh, 2.1. Okay. Revision. So the question here is: Let's say I've, I'm working on a revision 2 and a revision 2.1, and revision 2 I've frozen because I've released it, and there are CD-ROMs out in the wild, or tarballs, or whatever the bits the kids use these days are, and I've found a bug in revision 2. Uh, I've fixed it in my 2.1 branch and I want to backport that fix. This is something that revision control weenies tend to call cherry picking. I'm a self-labeled weenie, by the way. This is not a pejorative term. Um, the answer is you can do it using a patch as, uh, as something that you would support as a first class operation. Cherry picking is a very difficult thing to do. There are a, maybe two or three revision control systems that handle it relatively well. Perforce is one. Um, another would be um, actually kind of subversion almost handles it well because subversion has no notion of merging at all, right? Um, another one would be Arch, which is explicitly built in those terms, but uh, I wouldn't recommend that anybody use Arch. Uh, a final one would be Darks, uh, which is one of the theoretically interesting but not practical ones um, that is written in Haskell of all languages. And, and Darks has this wonderful quantum mechanical, I kid you not, theory of patches that it is built up on so that you can talk in terms of patches commuting with each other and boundaries beyond which they cannot go and so on and so forth. And it tends to go exponential in space and time quite frequently. So it's, it's, it's got some fundamental theoretical problems that are not addressable. Yes? So now it seems with Mercurial that first an engineer does some work in his local area, tests it out, and you know, in a corporate setting or even in a you know, project setting, you have to then publish your changes out to the world. But since it's now, it feels like it's a two-stage commit, you know, you know, but you have to make your changes, then you have to actually publish them, it seems like it's easier to accidentally forget uh, to publish them. Is there so any the, way to make that less painful? The, the, question, the question is, um, is, it, is, it, is there an easy way to publish your stuff with Mercurial or presumably by extension with other distributed tools so that other people can find them? And, and the answer is that um, right now you have to do stuff by hand um, because we've been focusing on the core of the software rather than on uh, these sort of larger usability questions. Um, that sort of thing where you want to be able to see, oh, I haven't actually published this even though I wanted to, or oh, this repository that I've made changes based on is actually has diverged from me by this much. You want to be able to tell those kinds of things without having to explicitly do it by hand all the time. Those are things that I would really love to see, um, but they're not quite there yet because 
we've, we've been preoccupied with just getting the core functionality into 1.0 form so far. Do remember that we've only been around for about 14 months and the, the, the set of core developers is quite small. Yes, more questions? Yeah. Uh, do you have any ideas like how you would use uh, Mercurial to supplement another source control system? Like, uh, uh, the question is, um, would it be possible to supplement an existing revision control system using Mercurial? And the answer is, um, there, there are various different ways that you can do that. So somebody has, for example, written an incremental perforce importer for Mercurial. So there, there, there exists a, a proof that it is possible to do what you want today. I don't know how well it works. One direction. Um, I, I imagine that it is one directional, yes. There's also a tool called Taylor, written by um, a guy in Italy whose name is Emmanuel Gaifax. And Taylor is sort of the uh, Rosetta Stone of revision control tools. It, it will convert between arbitrary revision control tools up to a point. Um, it doesn't have a very good notion of branching or merging, so it tends to lose information when talking between distributed revision control tools. But if, you, if what you're looking to do is an incremental conversion and then stuff some things back into a host revision control tool, it is actually pretty nice, and it's relatively straightforward to use. What about just for maintaining your patches and submitting them? Okay. My question is for maintaining patches and submitting them, whether it would be suitable for that. In, in that kind of a case, probably the easiest thing to do would be to use a perforce importer to pull your stuff into Mercurial, maintain things as patches, then commit them um, back to the native revision control tool, perhaps by hand or perhaps by automating it. Um, I, I, I don't speak perforce very much anymore, so I can't say that it would, whether, whether it would be completely trivial or not. My, imagine is that my imagination tells me that it would be a relatively small amount of scripting to do. More questions? Uh, for those of you who have uh, 12 o'clock meetings, uh, we're, going, we're running over our time right now, which is not a problem, apparently not a problem in this room, but you may have your own Yes. Okay. So in the format of Mercurial, is it a uh, Python uh, object serialized? Uh, the question is, is the uh, Mercurial data stream uh, Python objects? The answer is no. And uh, the reason that it's not is that um, Python has been somewhat willing to uh, change the uh, the data stream format, and uh, that's not a terribly good thing. Also, it's not a very efficient storage mechanism. Instead, what we do is we explicitly lay out the bytes ourselves using uh, tools like struct.pack and uh, using um, string operations and, and just plain old write. So we know exactly what the bytes are supposed to be. Yes? How does it deal with uh, uh, authorization? How do we deal with authorization is the question. And uh, there are... There are two or three answers to that, depending on how you want to look at it. The first is that we have no notion of authorization at all, because Mercurial doesn't care. The second, which is a more satisfactory answer, is that if you want to be able to share changes with other people, you can push to a shared repository, um, which you can use using, for example, if you're all on the same file system, Unix groups or, NF or, um, or Windows permissions. You can also tunnel over SSH so that you can do that over um, the uh, insecure internet. Um, somebody is in the process of adding support for pushing changes over HTTP, which will use, I presume, some form of user authentication, whatever Apache happens to provide, and will be secured over um, SSL. So Mercurial itself doesn't have to care, but it has various different transports that do allow you to specify things in different ways. And for example, there is um, an extension to Mercurial available that will let you lock down individual user accounts and put ACLs on the subtrees that people are allowed to push to. So if you have changes that push stuff into a tree that you're not allowed to push to, you will be forbidden from doing that and other people won't be able to pull those changes because they won't get in in the first place. So there are various different ways that you can lock things down. Yes? Is that SSH tunneling built in Mercurial like it is in Subversion, or is it manual to open up the SSH? The well, question is, is SSH tunneling built in? And the answer is yes. Okay. We use SSH colon slash slash bloody 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 URLs. Any more questions? Okay, thank you all very much for listening.